I'd like to thank the uh, Department of Academic Affairs for helping to support this lecture series. And we've been doing it for over 20 years, and so uh, some of you have been coming for about that long, so thank you for that. Um, today's talk is by Dr. Jay Burns, uh, Associate Professor at the University of Michigan School of Nursing. Uh, the talk is Breaking Barriers, Enhancing Reproductive Health Access for Urban Youth Through Community Engaged Research and, and Social Media. Uh, Dr. Burns will give a little bit of uh, her background during her talk, but I uh, do want to say that uh, Dr. Burns is a talented researcher uh, working on uh, some research funded by the NIH, the National Institute of Health currently, is a teacher uh, and a talented cl clinician as well, and has won awards from the Society for Adolescent Healthcare and Medicine, the Racial Justice and Health Equity Award, um, the Institute for Healthcare Policy and Innovation Clinical Scholar Award, and the Paul Ambrose Scholar Award. Uh, Dr. Burns uh, not only teaches at the University of Michigan, but is a graduate, uh, has her undergraduate degree there, uh, her PhD is from the University of Michigan, and has a master's from the University of Pennsylvania. So, without further ado, please help me welcome Dr. Jay Burns. Good, 
so the school kinesiology. And then um, I know U of M Flint has the PT program. So, and then Wayne State and some others too. Um, and I, I'm partial to that because my husband's a physical therapist. So we work very well together. Uh, and has anybody done like work? Not necessarily research, but work in like an urban area or rural area with your job or anything? So just yes, okay. <laughs> so good. So a, a lot of the stuff that I do um, looks at uh, uh, you know ways to promote equity in health in urban places and things that can be also um, duplicated in rural areas or places that just need more assistance. And in this case, it's with youth. of who I am as a person. Um, I am a researcher, I'm a clinician. Uh, I have my PhD, but clinically I'm a pediatric nurse practitioner. So I've been working in what we call federally qualified health centers for over a decade, almost 12, actually 12 years. And so federally qualified health centers are uh, places that provide care to anybody, but uh, more so um, organizations that you know, take on Medicare, Medicaid, uh, for those who are medically underserved and um, they're everywhere across the state of Michigan and throughout the United States. And so the clinic that I work for is Detroit Community Health Connection. They have seven clinics across Detroit, and I still practice, um, even as a faculty person, uh, I just you know, do contingent, um, and, and I see uh, young people and you know, babies and, and whatnot. And I could go into, usually if, if I have enough time, I'm always like, do you all know what a nurse practitioner is? So have you ever, have you heard of a nurse practitioner? Yes, okay, good. So we'll stop there so if you have any more questions about that. But a lot of the questions that I had that uh, developed from for research came from being as a clinician. Uh, and so as a researcher, I'm an assistant professor at uh, Michigan. He gave me a promotion associate professor. I'm on the tenure track, so you know that means I gotta put in a bunch of materials and hopefully they'll give me a permanent job for the rest of my life and they can't fire me. So this is not just recording, so I'm just saying putting in here. <laughs> and I'm a community and pediatric expert. I mean, I've had every job in terms, I think, of uh, working with young people. So if you want to become an expert in, in anything that you do, someone told me you have to work like 40,000 hours or something like that. But if you think about things that you need to do to get to where you want to go, then you, know, you have to either expose yourself to those jobs or people or places. And for me, I've been a coach. I used to run an adolescent clinic. Um, you know, I've been a mentor, still a mentor. I mean, there's lots of rules that, I, um, that I've had with young people. And adolescents are my passion. They're not everybody else's passion. Um, I like working with them because they keep me young. I like hearing about the drama and all the little moody things that a lot of other people <laughs> may not want to hear. It just, for some reason, I just like it. Um, and the community, I've been involved with the community. I've worked as a nurse uh, in, in Detroit and, on, and out east. Uh, I worked at Henry Ford Hospital in the ER, which was my first job. It's a level one trauma center, which means that you see the worst type of trauma in that area. So that could be gunshots, it could be blunt trauma, and you're, you know, it's basically everything that you see on the TV. So um, I just was hoping when I started that job that everyone would live, they did. Um, and so I learned a lot from that the job, including what a team culture, like everything that, that I do now stems from that job mainly because it's not just the nurse or the physician, it's everybody in that circle to help keep that patient alive. So that means the ultrasound tech, the respiratory therapist, the pharmacist, it takes a team to do anything that you do and that also comes through in my research. I'm a mother and a wife. I have a great um, husband, he's, he's really great. Um, he's, like I say, he's a physical therapist. Um, I have two children, I have a one-year-old and a 10-year-old and um, that's why I needed to drive up here. So, keep saying. <laughs> so um, and then I like social media, I love social media, so all this is about to be on social media. Uh, but it's, it's for the benefit in terms of what people need to learn um, about you know, what I'm talking about and also the populations that I'm talking to and um, about and for. And so um, I really thought, this is the first time I've actually spoken to a community college uh, 
group. Usually it's at a conference or you know the clinic or something, but this was why, this is what I was really excited about. And then the last is that I like to run, um, I travel a lot and I like spending time outside. And so that's it. So um, I have a website, it's uh, www.thedrblab.com and it's, it'll, it'll pop up at the end. But these are some of the projects that I've worked on that I've had funded through um, grant opportunities. Um, the Young Men's Health Matters program is what I'm gonna talk about a lot. Um, and that's what received my NIH funding. And um, so that is federal funding. I got a large grant of almost a million dollars to um, study communities in underserved areas. Normally, people want to do clinical trials in a hospital, but the NIH believed in me and the folks that work with me that it starts with the community first. Which when you think about it, it really does. A lot of the issues with healthcare, if they're not addressed at, at that first level, then you see chronic conditions, right? Or you see mental health conditions that are not diagnosed, and eventually people end up in the hospital and it's like a cyclical thing. They go through the ER, they, I mean, I have a primary care provider, but if you have those resources available or understand things like transportation and we talk about the social determinants of health, um, it's very important um, to understand how those things work. So back to the slide. Um, so Young Men's Health Matter, uh, Matters Program is the one that I currently work on now that's funded. The Stay Safe Project has closed out and that is um, a study that looks at qualitative data. Um, do you all know the difference between quantitative and qualitative data? So quantitative is like your numbers, your metrics, your survey. And qualitative data is, is how you, it's the why. Like why did they answer that? Why did they pick that option? And let's go further into that, right? Um, so that basically looked at young men in the clinic and, and how um, they address their care. Like why are they going to the clinic? And we looked at two different groups the ones who do not go to the clinic uh, versus the ones who do, and why is it so important for those folks to go to the clinic when they may have a lot of barriers in place? How do they, what is the, um, what is the goal of them, or, or why is it, like I said, so important for them to get there and help to share those values with the people who cannot get to the clinic so that everybody can get healthcare and get around some of those barriers. Um, Black Nail's opinion on, or BMO, is just a social media study that, that we released just, um, Marketing and media just to get opinions on like what men think about healthcare, uh, and so that was that was good in terms of how we market um, our projects and, and, and how and the services that are available to the population. And then mass is a project um, that looks at masculinity and how does how does that influence healthcare seeking behaviors. And so um, there was a study that was done on transgender health. And so these were folks who, um, you know, are now men, and, and how does that, um, how does that, what does that look like now that um, they are men? And so we use the same survey tool um, on just black men to see what, how does alcohol, how do these different behaviors or, or, or these different peer pressures interact um, with seeking out healthcare? Because um, oftentimes men do not. Um, just say I'm gonna go get some help, right? It's manifested in other ways that may be like drinking or um, other behaviors that uh, or that that don't require you to talk about it sometimes, okay? So we wanna know, like, we use that particular tool and that paper is coming out to share um, how men feel about seeking out healthcare. Like, what is it, what, what is it important for? Like, what are they looking for in a provider, right? What are they looking for in a clinic? Those things are very important. Okay. And so now these are the new projects that I'm working on, so new media. So do you all know what new media is? No, okay. So old media is, we think it's radio, television, the newspaper. So a lot of the things that we're used to seeing, right? So new media is anything that has technology to it. So social media, websites, apps, those things. How do we interface with those, um, even like now chat GPT, how do we interface with those things um, to help us figure out what like, healthcare and how, um, again, when we look at services and those type of things. And so um, what we're doing now is we're building, we're doing intervention. So I've done all this work with the, the previous slides and now I'm trying to create an intervention that can be not only used for adolescents and young men, but different adolescent populations. So um, teen moms or homeless teens 
or LGBTQ teens. And so we're looking at ways to how to market things using media um, to better inform um, providers, young people. Um, but in my preliminary work, the media is just kind of like the segue. The young people that I interviewed, the focus groups and the surveys, um, they just want to talk to their healthcare provider, but there's no communication. There's nothing to motivate them to come to the clinic. So whether it is getting a ride or transportation, or whether it is coming into a clinic and having like male-friendly services or someone that looks like you, those things aren't available. So we're trying to figure out how to market. Um, and it's almost like persuasive marketing. So. so the end goal is to, now do you all use social media? What kind of social media do you use? LinkedIn? LinkedIn was the first one, if you didn't know that. How about Facebook? So, so wait, who doesn't use social media? Because I don't want to put you up. Does anybody not use it? Because some people just don't want to use it. They just want to be like, I'm, I'm good. OK. So Instagram, right? OK, Twitter, which is X now. Um, Reddit, Snapchat. Um, OK, so all right. So a lot of my studies only stop. They stop at, they do. So the studies that I had before, they went through Facebook, Twitter, and um, uh, Snapchat and like we did websites because the IRB, which is the the body that approves for your research to be ethical, did not understand why Snapchat or um, Instagram. Well, they said Instagram later, but it was like a battle trying to you know say, hey, we need to use social media because they didn't understand what the benefit of it was when rapidly it was changing. Right? People use it for everything. Right? For information. So, um, so again, the ultimate goal is to. So this is. I'm just talking about myself. So I get on social media and I'm trying to buy some Nikes. And then 10 minutes later, some Nikes pop up that are pink, some Nikes that pop up that are for weight training, some Nike, you know, or, and then it comes with a Nike jumpsuit, and then it comes with a back. So basically, the computer is looking at the colors you like, um, your style, and you've seen this before, right? So it might be food, like it might be whatever it is, and it keeps like repetitively coming back up. So the end goal is to create that when someone starts looking um, for information about where to find a testing center for um, sexually transmitted infections or a condom or by condoms or, um, or you know, talk to someone about it. And so those systems will come up again and say, okay, you can go to this clinic and you can go get condoms here. And so it's basically reading how um, the person is online and, and pushing that information out for them to say, hey, hey, we see you that you're looking at, you know, so persuasively they're saying, let's move and get help here, right, in that particular area. Okay, and then the national perspectives of, of youth, this is with Michigan Medicine. This just looks at um, attitudes toward um, expedited partner therapy and home test kits. So we are surveying, sur surveying young people and through the pandemic, um, it was hard to get people reproductive health care, not just like men, but like all young people, or most young people 18 to 24. And so um, we were trying to figure out creative ways to get people their birth control or, um, you know, so some school-based, school-linked clinics, you can't do it in the school, but you can do it in a linked clinic that's not in the school. They were meeting people at the corners and they were doing all these extra things um, to make sure that young people would get care so that they wouldn't get pregnant or they needed a vaccination. And so. It's more than just condoms, it's like HPV vaccine and those type of things. Um, so yeah, well, we, we just got, um, we just, we we're just finishing this up and we are um, getting the results of this. The problem with these type of surveys is that, you know, you give like a $5 um, incentive and so you're looking for like 200 or 300 people in this particular study, we got like 5,000 people who responded, but they were like bots. And so we have to like, we're, we're gonna write a paper about like, how do you like get the real people because they, you bypass some of the security things. So, um, so yeah. Okay. <coughs> okay. So just the, the learning objectives here. I'm just gonna kind of gloss through this. Um, you know, I, I've talked about this before, but you know. Basically, my discussion is about inequities in health that affect um, young people, specifically young black men. Um, but they are not 
you know, it's just not also young black men. Young people, and I'll, in the next slide you'll see, like what are the biggest things that are impacting them? We gotta figure out ways to reduce some of these risks. Mental health has been, since the pandemic has been pushed up way high, and mental health is like that thing in between, and so if you're not, um, Feeling so hot, you don't always make the best decisions in terms of substance use, um, you, know, you know, in terms of engaging in risk behaviors. So um, you're gonna learn some ways to apply the knowledge that can positively impact those dealing with dis disparate or unequal care. Um, and then you're gonna learn about what community-based partnerships are and how to develop them, and it's really important. Like, I can sit up here all day and talk to you about this, but part, again, probably like the third reason why I'm here is that I'm used to showing up. Like, when you go to the communities, email, Zoom does not work. You gotta show up. You gotta talk to the community health workers, you gotta talk to the clinicians, you gotta talk to, you know, the executive leadership if they're available, because they're so bombarded with a lot of other things that it's personal. So you have to establish a relationship and you also have to uh, establish trust too. So th this is just some brief data on adolescent and young adult health. So injuries, including road traffic, drowning, violent self-harm, um, and maternal conditions are leading causes of death among adolescents and young adults. Half of all mental health disorders in adults start by age 14. Um, and they're, you know, but most cases are undetected and untreated. Main issues for adolescent and young adult health include, again, unintentional inju injuries. Number four is interpersonal violence. Mental health, we're seeing a lot of depression and anxiety. Alcohol, drug use, tobacco use, HIV, AIDS, and other infectious diseases, early pregnancy, and uh, there's another like host of things. And the last is adolescent rights. Are you all familiar with adolescent rights? So each state is different in that um, at starting at the age of 14, a young person can go ahead and seek out mental health. So that means they don't have to have a consent of a parent. Um, they can get up to so many visits, like 10 or 12 visits, and, and, but unless it's something like if they're gonna hurt themselves or harm somebody else, then you have to you know, pull in that adult or guardian, right? Then things like getting um, tested for sexually transmitted infections, um, getting treatment if you're positive for an STI, uh, they're all, you don't have to have an adult, so. Um, uh, and then also if you are dealing with substance abuse, some folks who are heavily you may or may not agree with this, but like their marijuana use or other types of use, um, street drugs, we're seeing fentanyl right now um, that are just laced and, you know, that's a different thing, but just trying to navigate um, party drugs, you can go and seek help for that on your own. So, um, and then the only issue is uh, that if you're in the school, the school can provide you and be your primary care provider. I don't know if you have school-based clinics on the side. They, I know they have a few, but Southeastern Michigan has a ton, um, at least 75, and they're all, not all, they're mostly sponsored by like Henry Ford and um, Ascension Health and Trinity and those type of places. And the only problem with the, um, some of those other places is that they're Catholic-based organizations. So. Some of the things that you may be able to get in, in different school-based settings, you can't always get, and then there's always the policies that impact um, all the schools in Michigan. Also, the model is for, um, uh, to teach sex education is from an abstinence pers perspective, and youth must get permission to get comprehensive education on sexual health. So, I could go all, I could go, just, just because I ran an adolescent clinic for so many years, like, like we'd have the young folks come in, and um, they just had so many questions and 80% of the services were reproductive health. Okay, so for young black males, so why young black males? So in the United States, uh, this population has a substantially greater need for sexual reproductive health services and at a higher risk of contracting STIs than any other young adult populations. Um, they're often unaddressed and insufficiently understood in clinical settings. A lot of times when you look at young black men or just black men, if they're having um, reproductive health discussions, it's around MSM, which is men who have sex with men. So there's no teasing out, and you're assuming that um, another man is having another relationship with a man, but we just want basic health care for men. And if you think about it, not just young men, but have you all heard of Healthy People 2030, or 2020, or 2010? There's no objective for men. There's none. I'm sorry, you're not high. <laughs> 
So when we look, you know, and then yet there are things like heart disease and, hy um, and hypertension and diabetes that impact um, men of all ages, prostate cancer. And so these things that happen, guess what? They have to start at what age? 18 to 24, or the emerging adulthood um, age, because in that age group, we start to look at like prefrontal, prefrontal cortex and decision making and judgment making. And half the time, we're, we, you know, when you look at young people, you're like, why are you going there? What did you? But well, you have to expose them and help them make these decisions to make them uh, learn healthy habits, like exercising every day, or walking 30 minutes, or eating your fruits and vegetables, right? Who, who eats, yeah, eat fruits and vegetables, right? <laughs> so it's. It's a way of life, and so um, you have to make sure those things are instilled. So we did a survey, um, uh, and so this was a survey that we, we did uh, through social media and through marketing, and we asked people about, do they go to primary, this is really small writing, but what kind of clinic do they go to, um, or healthcare facility, um, and what are the reasons why they go to these facilities, and how many times a year do they go to the clinic? And so we found out that and we also include, so the darker colors are the eligible sample, but we also wanted to look at the people that were ineligible. Ineligible meant if they were like 25 or 26, because that's still an important age, but your insurance changes at 25 versus 18 to 24. And so we learned that primary care community clinics were the number one, um, and then followed by hospital for the eligible sample, urgent care, um, and then the public health department. But as you see, healthcare changes, insurance, the ineligible that were 25, 26, et cetera, the hospital is, or ERs, are the number one places that they're going um, to utilize care. And so that is not a primary care place. You need to have someone to take care of your primary care. The other thing is, what do we look at? Why do they go? Um, and so annual sports physical, STI testing, or treatment. Those are the top reasons why young men wanted to go to the clinic or just to get care. And so there's gotta be more than that, right? I mean, and usually when I was in the clinic, they had a new job. So if it wasn't to play a sport, or you know, like get that physical right before you go to college and play the sport, because depending on the age, they had a new job for a pre-employment physical, okay? And then the number of visits to the health clinic during the previous year. So we learned that the, again, the darker sample is the eligible sample. Um, and wait, oh, wait, I think it's on the next slide, how many folks? But yeah, anyways. So we learned that three to four times a year was for both like the highest in terms of how often were they reaching out for health care. Now, I guess it gets different when you get older. I know my, for myself, like I have my annual physical, you know, I got my OB visits, I got referrals, or whatever the case is. Um, but I try to make that, you know, in my annual, like I got all these visits, right? Um, and then also if you're a kid, like I have like the one-year-old, um, you have two, four, six, and I know this is a piece, two, four, six, not wait, two, four, six, nine catch up, 12, 15, 18, 24 month visit, right? So you have all those visits, you know, but that's mandated. But as you get older, the visits get once a year, right? So you gotta, you gotta figure out, okay, like, after they reach 18, what's gonna happen next? And then we looked at reporting yes to, have you ever had sex before? Um, most of the samples said yes. And then always using a method to prevent STIs and pregnancy, if they had sex. Right, so it, it, there's, there's, all, there's birth control, there's condoms, and there's different types of barrier methods. The eligible sample says 64.5%, but the ones who are 25, 26, said they do use contraceptive methods or things to help them to prevent the partner from getting um, pregnant. And I always tell the young people when I come in, it takes two to tango. Now, you should know, you know, because you know, it's, it's a different sample because I'm doing school links, so this is not in the school, so we can have these discussions. But I say, do you know what she's on? Or do you know what they're on? And they're like, oh no, that's no. I, and so, and likewise with the young lady, I'm like, well, do you know how to use a condom? Oh no, that's, no. You need to know both sides. And it's very important, so we have to educate and then also teach the skills of how to use um, condoms or to learn what, um, you know, the partner's going through if they're on birth control, that type of thing. Also, I did a study with Apple Maps. Um, I'm sorry, I'm partial to iPhone, so Google Maps wasn't in this one. But we wanted to see, um, if you're not going to get health care from a primary care clinic, then where, you get, then, where you get it, <clears throat> excuse me, then where are you getting it from, right? And so all these little dots, this was just Walgreens, but we had more than this. We had gas stations, we had, all, we had other places except the actual health care clinic that they were getting condoms and, 
you know, you know, whatever the else that they needed um, for, you know, their event. Their, you know, what, you know. I, sorry, I, I talked. To, I'm trying to like make it because I talk to young people different than I talk to the folks. So like, just when they go out, right? Um, and so this is in Detroit. This is like by Eight Mile. And so I, we found out and published on this too. So one of the things that's really important is, is that when you have all these results, you gotta write about it. Whether it's in a journal paper or an op-ed or like Detroit News, people need to know about these things. And I know you get notifications from some, whether it's on your email, from um, you know, um, your local news or your newspaper um, online. And so like these things need to be you know, evident for young people. And so, what I found out was is that um, young people were, this group that we were talking to, um, they were paying for condoms almost triple the price. We also found out that like, you can write prescriptions for condoms um, and it's free. But some of the pharmacies were blocking to fill the prescriptions. And so how do you, like, add, how do you teach a person to, well, we, did, we, you know, we did this, you know, look in terms of what pharmacy, and I can tell you who, but like, um, you know, they would come back, I'm like, well, tell us, you know, so we started having, making a list, and so then we talked to the providers there, and the, ph the pharmacists there, and like, why aren't you filling these prescriptions? Because this is very important, right? So you can get a whole box of condoms, but if you can't get it filled, then you're going to a gas station for paying almost, for one condom, you're paying like three, four dollars, and it may have only, the expiration date may be like two or three months, versus condoms has, a whole box has a longer life, usually like a year, right? And then they're not looking at that, right? So I'm, we're, that's another educational piece. So this was important to know where they were getting, um, you know, their reproductive health services um, fulfilled. Okay, so here's the urgency to address this matter. So I talked to you about um, the clinics, um, you know, where they were going, the results, like in terms of like other places outside the clinic. So um, in this age range, age range, excuse me, 18 to 24 years, 18 to 24 years have a substantially greater need for sexually reproductive health services and are at a higher risk of contracting sexual transmitted infections. Wayne County has the highest in the state between the ages of 20 and 24, so there's a need there. So studies show that significant factors in decision making to seek preventative services include concerns about stigma. So stigma, these are reasons why people aren't going. So stigma, because it's not cool to go or maybe they don't want their peers to see them, the cost. Folks do the guilt thing on young people. But it's not about that, like, young people are supposed to engage in risky behaviors, but how they handle it is where, where we come in to help, right? How they navigate that is where we come in to help. So, you know, you wouldn't, well, I wouldn't, you wouldn't be in a car without a seat belt, right, if you're driving, right? If the rain was pouring cats and dogs, you'd have an umbrella or something to cover you. Why would you just run out there with nothing, right? And so that's what we talk about, um, you know, at the, you know, the provider and patient. And also clinic wait times. We have people who may have transportation issues, and this is, this is in Detroit. Um, they may call for transportation service, they may get a lift or whatever, but they may be in the waiting room all day long, right? So we need to follow up. Front desk people are very important. Like, why are you waiting, you know, like, how can we, you know, to ask them, so how are you arranging your transportation? So just asking those questions are very important. And then at STI and HIV testing, the fear of the result. So what if it is positive, right? So, and with men, and I don't want to get too much into it, so like, um, the anatomy is different. So when the symptoms are showing for a man, that means it's been there for a long time. Just saying. And so we don't know what has gone in between this time and this time. So we really need to actively screen every single time someone comes in. All right. Um, so, I always tell healthcare providers, so if you're interested in, you know, or you are a healthcare provider, we know, uh, we have a lot of knowledge. And so, nurses are the number one trusted provider in this country. And we see a lot, and we do a lot, and we're with the patient a lot. And so, you know, we can have these discussions with them. And we have to understand that culture, culture plays a factor, socioeconomic status, whether you have the money or not plays a factor, and also your neighborhood, like who's around there, who are your friends, what do your parents say, what does your partner say, all of those play a factor in, in choosing um, a, you know, a provider or getting healthcare services or understanding what you can get in terms of um, bettering your health. All right, so I don't have much time, I could talk about this all day long. 
But for me, the purpose of my work was to, and together we defined future research questions and we wanted to ensure sustainability. Um, so overall, improving community engagement, build trust, build tailored programs for, and for young men. But I'm gonna tell you what ha really happened. This is not what, this is what the slide says, but I'm gonna tell you what really happened. So I didn't even have a PhD yet. I was a nurse practitioner, had my master's degree, and I kept seeing all this stuff. And I knew I was gonna get a PhD, but I didn't think about studying any of this stuff in the clinic. And so the more I, you know, you know became a director, or the more I, I had, um, well, I was privy in seeing things about billing, and like how that's an issue where you have to like, with parents, you can turn it on or off, right? Um, and so, so they don't know all the time for privacy issues, um, you know, they, like invasive services, yes, like physicals and, and blood work, but just protecting the adolescent, I was like, wow, this kid, you know, this is just really driving me crazy. So I went to the CEO and I told him, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm you know, I'm on a PhD program. I said, but when I'm finished, I'm coming back and we're going to get some money. And we're going to fix all these, well, some of these problems and we're going to try the best that we can. We're going to get some real money, some like real money. And he's just like, look at me. He's like, okay, okay, Jay. All right, whatever. And they get a lot of money, but like in terms of programming, nobody's measuring the outcomes. I said, yeah, we're gonna like measure outcomes. He's like, oh, there's so many outcomes. You know, because there's a lot that goes on in these clinics. Adolescent health isn't the only thing that's important, right? But um, I told him, I said, well, we're gonna figure it out. And I finished my PhD and I, you know, I, I came back and I said, we're gonna write a grant together. And he's like, okay, you know, whatever. And, and all of them are like, and I said, no, I'm serious. I said, allow me to do all these things. So I had, I already had a report. I already identified, you know, um, issues that were there and I wanted to see if it matched some of the, the research interests, right? Um, and so that's why we started serving the community and the, uh, the patients there, right? And so that's the hardest part of it, right? You, if you don't already have something built in, and that's the biggest question that I usually get, how can you get there and get there fast? Because it takes a long time for people to trust you. Because you know what, when I go into places in the city, and when I show up, and I know this is on the video, they don't ask about me being a professor at the University of Michigan. They ask me, who do you know in the city? What job do you have? How long have you been there? Like, that's what they're interested in. How engaged are you in the community? Later on, they realize that we have a lot of resources at Michigan, but they want to know me as uh, who I am as a person, not as an academic all the time, because there's been a history um, with universities and researching uh, marginalized populations that come in and they come out and they don't give back. And I'm not saying that that's like Michigan or whatever. I'm just saying um, just beware. And so sometimes they'll close the door on you. So anyways, so I'm going to speed this up a little bit because I don't have much time. Um, so just real quick, uh, community-based participatory research is, it just means equitable uh, partnership and involves uh, the community partner in all aspects of the research process. That means when I write a grant and I write like letters of support or, or you know, I make sure that am I describing the entity correctly, right? I need to know how many patients you serve, I need to know the demographics, and then also when I publish, everyone who's on there, whether it's the CEO, the chief medical officer, the community health worker, they're on that paper too. Because they are part of the team that made it happen, right? Um, and so understanding a given phenomenon, and then we integrate knowledge that can help create an intervention. And so an intervention is something that's scientifically tested, and then we replicate it, and it can be used not just in the clinics that I um, impact or that I work with, but any clinic that is dealing with this particular matter of adolescent health. And so, you know, the CDC has best approved programs that people can model, or there's resources that clinics can use or clinicians can use, and that's the whole goal, because there's nothing actually out there for men, again, so. All right, well, there's actually not a lot for you people, but yeah. So real quick, we did a needs assessment. Does everybody know what a needs assessment is? What's, what's nurses, what's a needs assessment? Real quick, I mean, you don't need to be like, cut and dry. Yep, the strengths and the weaknesses. It's a snapshot and it's required by the nonprofit. So a lot of the things that I do, it also helps with their own grants that are funding them, their own data that they need. And that is also what, where it's mutual too because myself and my team that comes in and me also working there as a provider, I, I already know like, okay, they gotta do this by February. Um, we call it what HEDIS measures. 
there's stuff that's required by the state, and a lot of the things that we do together also checks the box for that uh, particular center. Um, and so also the needs assessment helps with policy changes, it tailors health services to a specific population, and again, trust is a main thing. All right, then we built the partnership, right? So we made a community advisory board, and so now um, we have got another grant, so, um, but I'll tell you about that later. But the community advisory board for the Young Men's Health Matters, oh, and so in that needs assessment we found out that, um, I, I didn't tell you the results, the results where we found out that um, obesity, as in um, ob like a, a child being overweight, mental health, and reproductive like education were the top three, and housing was the fourth, were the top three things that were important for young people. Um, and so then we got a community uh, advisory uh, board together, and they were comprised of people from all over um, Detroit. So the requirement um, was to either work or live in Detroit. And so we had people from public health, job training, education, um, sports, youth, and we had about 52 members express interest, and we had 15 members attend usually each session. And so the top um, data that we found we published on this was socioeconomic factors, behavioral health, substance abuse, lack of education, violence and health issues, and those are kind of broad, but like, I'll just take mental health. Um, so we got, there were mostly men, but there were some women there. When you, when, when they came in, um, and I, and I talk, I talk, talk about this before in, in a lot of my presentations, but it, it always surprises me, because I don't run these groups. I, I learned in my dissertation that I just sit on the wall and I have um, either men or young men do all the stuff, so you gotta be part of the community. I acknowledge that I'm a person of color, but I'm not a, a man. So there are some things, I guess it's guy code or whatever, um, that when someone else is talking to, there's a better response and answer to um, the question. And so when we started talking about, um, it says here, what do you believe are the most pressing behavioral health issues in the community among young adult men? And you see what is in there, right? Anger, drugs, rage, trauma. So I'm spe specifically speaking about where I'm at. Um, but these are men that, that we're talking about, these and young men too. But what I found was is that after everyone introduced themselves and you know, said they did this, that, and the other, these sessions turned into uh, like therapy sessions for them. So you know, I'm just sitting there listening to them, and then and, and people they didn't want to stop. They didn't want to. I mean, we were there for an hour and a half eating, you know, whatever. And I know people have things to do during their workouts, but they didn't want to leave because there weren't a lot of outlets for people, you know, of this type of group to share. And it was actually really nice. Um, and so, you know, they they wanted to come back, and then then COVID hit, and so. The end goal was to do a, a big conference, and so we ended up doing it online. But, um, so yeah, the pandemic hit, we turned virtual. Um, that's Detroit, that's um, from the Canada side. So, we got a beautiful Detroit River, so. Um, and so these, these events, so because we couldn't do things in person, we just started making events that were tailored to what the Community Advisory Board were um, interested in. And so that Black Men's Health Summit, we did it all virtually. And this was a while ago, but um, it happened, we, we created the event about two and a half weeks, three weeks before the George Floyd event happened. And within like, I don't remember, it was like a week or less than a week, we got like over 400 responses to this conference online. <laughs> we were like, what? Because there wasn't anything planned yet for people to talk about this. And so, we had all this lined up, but this, this, it was just a good timing, and then we had a survey to measure things that, you know, what, what do they need in terms of their own health care. So that was a different, the one, what I presented in the beginning was just 18 to 24 year olds. This was just men who attended. This, people were from California, they were in Georgia, they were in Michigan, majority Michigan. Um, at the time we had the chief of police, we had the lieutenant governor, we had, um, had uh, one of the former quarterbacks from U of M talk about why it's important, you know, you know to have success, to have a virtual 5K. And um, so in that time, this, all of these events, all this, we showed that we could reach people in both online and hybrid methods, right? And so that's what the grant is, you know, that we're doing now, but we're tailoring, tailoring excuse me, these um, type of events and outcomes to be in person now. 
And so um, we, right now I'm working on a study um, that it, it, it is completed, has been completed. It's a barbershop study, testing for reproductive health, but they gave them information on both topics. And so I'm adding these new things in to improve what I already did um, like about a year or two ago. And we're improving the, you know, in childcare, internet, all that stuff, we're compensating for that, for, for that because, you know, that's what you should do. You shouldn't just, you know, some people want to do it because they want to help, but I feel people, you know, if, if they're giving, we should also give back to them. Um, and so, yeah, we got the money. And so I got a couple of awards that help keep moving this forward. And the last one was the Michigan Health Endowment Fund that just came in August. And so we, like, we have people who are partnering, like, um, I'm trying to contact now, um, not just the health clinics, but like, organizations like We Run 313, like um, a running club, or other places that incorporate health and fitness that all want to, it takes more than just, you know, going to the clinic, but what are the other things that, um, whether it's food or job employment, like um, Michigan Works and those type of things, are all partnering together. To, to create an ideal intervention and we're using social media to create these ads and um, things to say, hey, this is important, right? And so that's it, the main goal of the presentation was to describe the community academic partnership, how we work together, how there's more than just you know, one entity, but there are many people involved and that it takes trust is uh, the main thing. That's my son a, a little bit ago, um, the oldest one, um, and so, he now is an intern, so he comes to me with, uh, <laughs> to the community events, and he talks about things I haven't passed out literature, because I want him to know that, like, you gotta be in the community. And he, he, and I want him to be, I want him to see, I want him to see everything that's out there, not just within where we live, but like, other places too. Sometimes he likes it, sometimes he doesn't. There was one event, there was a lot of bees, and he just stayed in the mobile unit, and played whatever on the, whatever. But then there are other times he's actually been um, helpful. So, <laughs> anyway, so that's what I have for today. Um, I, you can email me at curryj at umich. I'm on Twitter, um, Facebook, and now um, I have, we have an Instagram page. But the young folks told me I need to do my own page because they looked at my personal page and said I'm really funny with my videos. And I need to do a professional page, um, also with my TikToks too. So um, I'm like, I can't have anything to myself. And so we have a website, um, and it's a really neat website. I have a lot of young people who are in here, nurses, we have people from the School of Business, um, kinesiology, people who just want to learn about community medicine and how to give back. So that's all I have for, for you today, folks. So if you have any questions, let me know. I do okay. such poor care and it kept coming up in clinical spaces. 
And so like in the needs assessment, 85% or 80% of the patients were women, young women. And the 20% that came in um, were men, 10% may followed up, and 5% were like consistently coming in. So it was like, it was like multiple factors. So A, like I have my own passions with my family, but I love adolescent health, I was able to combine something that I really love and that I could um, also replicate in other populations. Um, so, yeah. So, yeah, that was a good question. I'll ask a question while you're thinking. Um, we have two federally funded health clinics in town here, I'm aware of at least. Um, what would you suggest they do if they, which I suspect they are, recognizing that they have uh, a problem reaching adolescent males uh, in their clinics. Um, what can they do in terms of uh, improving their outcomes and maybe studying this issue more, other than having to come in? Uh, there's Hackley uh, Community. So you need to look at the 18 to 24 year old population, like period. Um, there has been a lot since COVID that has been, it's always been there, but it's been um, highlighted. And so I would suggest that um, they just look at their numbers. So a lot of times when I go into health centers, I'm, I, you know, it, it usually is an issue, but adolescence period is something that most clinics are kind of like on the fence. Not that they're just not, like they're more interested in the chronicity. They're interested in solving diabetes and hypertension and mental health, but Again, looking at the numbers and looking how much from a reimbursement perspective, um, looking at it from a um, funding perspective as identifying as a special population because they have to identify a special population. You can get more money from it as well too. But, um, and then also we had, a, we had a schooling clinic link, we had it with the health center. So, that would be another thing, like do they have, is it more pediatric services, or is it, do they do anything for adolescent health period? So if they don't, then that's the starting point right there. So if they, they lump all things together, like all their, their pediatric providers, um, you know, like how do you, like how are you addressing those needs of zero to uh, 18 and 18 and 24? So again, it's a metrics thing too. So if they don't have any adolescent health, then, then that period, would be an indicator that they need to look at it, depending on like, well, with the numbers now, like the American Academy of Pediatrics, there are so many pediatric organizations that have promoted like 18 to 24 year old health, whether it is young men or um, those who are pregnant, um, but young men just seem to be on the low part of it, but yeah. So again, to answer the, to kind of some of the question, like what are the metrics say within that organization? If they do not have something that's devoted to it, then they should really think about that because it's actually good for reimbursement too. So. so I really appreciate the barbershop, what was the barbershop talk? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so because historically, uh, the barbershop has been a place where young black men have gathered to talk and, and just feel uh, included or uh, validated in the environment. And so I appreciate that you are looking into that piece um, and using those barbers um, as a source of educating uh, in the community. And so I guess my question would be um, for, the, for the barbers, I know they have to go to school and get their education, and I'm just curious to know what part, what are they, what are they being taught in order to manage people in the community? Is that something that's being you know, looked at or utilized to maybe help with them being able to communicate effectively to help change the mindset of those people, of, of you know, our children that are going to those barbershops. I have two, sorry, I have three sons that literally have grown up in the barbershop. And so I know how that can be. So, yeah, what do you think about that? That's a good question, and the, the whole purpose was me, for me to move out of the clinic and look at gyms, clubs, barbershops. Barbershops have historically been used
support um, cancer, like prostate. Um, this was one of the first ones, and then they had a second one in New York that they did with young people. Um, so in terms, so the, the study's complete. So in terms of training, they have a whole like like a whole um, module of vignettes and all those things in terms of how to train the barbers. Um, I'm looking at more of the data, so I could use that model once we. So I'm I'm looking at what the young men said, um, and so like I'm looking at like condom use. I'm looking at like um, length of time. I'm looking at um, partners. Um, look, I'm looking at several factors to figure out. Okay. If we put, if whatever the question is, like, you know, either will you, if you got an ST, STI, what is your, um, what's the chances of you getting it within three months, six months, 12 months, right? So that's, I'm looking at that side for the young men, but the, but that curriculum for the barbers has already been, like, coined and established. So, um, so that is something that I plan to use um, in that particular model, but I would like to get more, more barbers in the community advisory board so that they can be on board. Last time we only had two, and they were on the east side of Detroit. And so I wanna make sure that if we're gonna use that model, that we get more than just one or two, that we get west side, east side, and some of the bordering um, cities that the young men go to. So um, that was an R01 study, which is like the gold standard study for a clinical trial. So thankfully, I have the permission to um, use some of that data. Now I just gotta get the men's side. Um, but I do agree that that is a trusted environment. Um, we got movies that talk about it. You know, like we have some movies that, you don't even, th you don't even think about it, but like they, you know, it is a place where uh, like a lot of information exchange occurs, so it's a safe place. Did I Do you ever find that like the concept of masculinity as a society that we have today prevents or discourages men from seeking out like health in general? Um, that is an excellent question, and that's the um, paper that that we're about to publish now. That. Masculinity makes, and, and this is not just with um, black men, but men, like the, the, the ability to be strong. Um, um, you know, we talk about masculinity in the sense of, you know, uh, there is a, there, there's a couple books that I'm thinking about in, in the back of my head. Um, but yeah, it does in terms of like what people think, like what people voice, um, what you share. This, and th some of those things that I listed, like stigma, uh, you know, or you know, fear of what people think, because you are the head of the household, right? You are the one who sets the tone. If you can't, you can't perceive weakness, and that individual plays a huge role. And that's what we had a lot of the um, folks who did the interviews talk about, like, um, like how I look is important. You know, um, my physical strength is important. Me working out is important, but not necessarily going to, you know, it's, it's more the outward appearance and what you see and how, you know, people are walking in everyday life that it puts the pressure on, right? And you can't drop those things. And so, and then, and then it transfers from culture to culture, right? And so when I talk about black men, um, black men isn't just like African-American men. We look at Caribbeans, people who come from um, uh, countries in Africa, like Ghana, Nigeria, we look at, um, Afro-Cuban, uh, we look at, once you come over to the States, people just see the color of your skin and they assume that you like all fit in this space. But culturally, masculinity means is different in different, yeah, cultures, yeah. So that's a good question. And, and, but the one thing that is the weakness part and then the ability to communicate really sets up a barrier because what do you tell your partner? You know, like, and then how do people perceive you? And so there's also scales that are used, um, you know, like, and I'm talking specifically about black men, like, um, there's, uh, uh, I'm just name. like, I've been going back and forth getting and trying to do this data that, that everything is like an acronym, but like some of the questions are like, 
um, being a player, or can you handle both things? Can you know, like how do you verbalize things in a certain manner? Versus just saying X, Y, Z, like just in plain language. So the dialect and the dialogue also play a factor in how you are, again, saying things about your health. Instead of just saying, I don't feel well, what does all that entail from a masculinity perspective? Which is not, someone's not just gonna say, I don't, I'm not saying that that's all men like that, but that's a very good question. Those, those barriers do exist, so thank you. Did I answer that okay? Do you find that a cultural divide shows up with healthcare providers and young black men? No, I have not looked at that. 
And part of the reason why is you have to come to the primary care person first to get, I mean, they can come on their own, but generally um, folks aren't always disclosing of that. You do a screen, you, you have like a screen like a PHQ-9 or a GAD, or I mean, these are acronyms for tests that are screenings that can say, this person's at risk for um, like loss of interest in something or anxiety, and then they refer them to the mental health provider. Now, if they go, um, I think there's been a relationship, you know, if they, you know, if, if it's all in the same space, so there's not like they're going across the way to get mental health and they're coming here for primary care, but if they're in a shared space, like what we call patient-centered medical home model where there's dental and nutrition and mental health, so there's no, there's nothing breaking, we see that they come a little bit more. But just to come in on their own and then go to primary care, I have not seen that, but um, that would be a good thing to add um, or ask a mental health provider, hey, with these patients, is, do you see, is there a connection, any correlation? Yes, exactly. Um, I, I wonder how much um, either a lack of health insurance or a perceived lack of health insurance uh, causes people not to seek care and what you found on that. I, mean, I remember having a student, this was pre-COVID, but he, he left a couple times during class, he wasn't looking so good. So I went and I talked to him, I said, hey, you're not looking so good. And he said, yeah, I, went, I was coughing up blood. And I said, oh, I see you need to get medical care now. And he said, no, 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 no I don't have health care. I, I, I don't have insurance. I'm not going anywhere. And so but I took him down to some help we had here, and he ended up, he, he did qualify for insurance, but he didn't even know it. And so I wondered if that 18 to 24 has particularly that problem. Um, yes, for like women's health, like pap smears and those type of things. Uh, so I'm going to speak from a federal, like from a health clinic, federal FQAC perspective. Um, we do stuff on a sliding scale fee, so there, so so people don't know that you can go to, to certain clinics. They they either lookalikes or FQHCs, and they just have to show an income or a phone bill, and um, basically you're paying two dollars or don't quote me on it, but you're paying a very minimal cost because they have money from the government to eat up those costs so they can get care. And so if you wait, then you're going into the ER. Right, and so that's a, a bill that you don't want because then you got to decide: Am I going to get an X-ray? Am I going to get a CAT scan? Am I going to get you know? Because all those things bill up. Also, they have people on site to help you enroll in uh, insurance. So, so those, those are called patient navigators, or um, sometimes in, instance community health workers, and they train them so that they can um, get the insurance that they need. Eighteen to twenty-four is is depending on where you're at, like. Um, if you can be in your parents' insurance and where they're employed at, and those type of things all play in the factor. And so when we had, it was really apparent when we had Obamacare and that whole, the uh, Affordable Care Act came out and we had like the website. And you can get insurance, but it's like, okay, you can get disaster type insurance where you just, something disastrous happens and you don't have to you know, get anything else you're gonna pay. And if, if, you're, if you do work somewhere, if you're a small business, and it's under so many people, do they give health insurance or do I have to go out and get Medicaid? Um, and so, and then if you have, if you've been diagnosed with um, things too, so a lot of those things like you gotta fill in the pot, but they usually have patient navigators to help you. And you can call somebody, you can call, um, you, you can literally Google, like, I tell people all the time, like just Google like, Google, like this word and, and this, this word with a clinic. And you can usually find someone, but the, the Healthcare, that's one thing, but understanding healthcare language is a literacy component to it also. So say you do find a clinic, and say you do get health insurance, then you gotta read these papers or online and be like, what does this mean? So there, there's that thing too, so. So yeah, did I answer it? Oh, yeah. If we have, of course other countries have universal Yeah, we have the worst health one of them. So the, so the discussion needs to happen when, like, so you have, like, state insurance up until, like, 17, 18, so, like, CHIP and S-CHIP and those type of things. Those conversations need to, to occur, the transition to another healthcare provider, you know, when students, like, um, are graduating from high school or when they're in college, if, they, if they're in community college or college, usually there's some type of health insurance that can, that can wedge in between 
um, that they can get. Um, but yeah, the conversations need to occur, but the providers aren't always, they don't have time to do They have a 15 minute visit or, you know, maybe that's not the priority at the time, but yeah. So. But they, but like you said, most of the time, like you can get the health insurance between that age gap. You just, it's the navigating the system is what's hard and the, the people who are in those positions to help you navigate, you gotta find them. So that's where the gap usually is. Thank you for all these questions. I didn't think there were any questions. <laughs>